Now, Jacob was called Israel after God got a hold of him. And today, there is a nation called Israel on this planet. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV as we learn about the Bible, the 66 books written by the 40 authors over 1,500 years. And we learn about God, very, very important. Corey is here to help us, Corey, what's up? I'm gonna be taking a look at the books of Chronicles themselves, Ryan. Well, today the Chronicler reviews the past, and so I'm gonna do that as well. Specifically, I'm gonna be reviewing the global flood of Noah's time. All right, very good. I look forward to that. Janice, what'd you do? I'm gonna talk about family. All right, very good. We're gonna be talking about a lot of things. Names is one of them. As we look at First Chronicles chapter two, and some of these names are challenging as we get into it, but these are genealogies that are presented here. So let's begin to explore and listen to what God is saying through them. First Chronicles 2, verses 1 through 7. These were the sons of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, and Shelah. These three were born to him by the daughter of Shua, the Canaanitess. Ur, the firstborn of Judah, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so he killed him. And Tamar, his daughter-in-law, bore him Perez and Zerah. All the sons of Judah were five. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hemtul. The sons of Zerah were Zimri, Ethan, Heman, Kalkal, and Dira, five of them in all. The son of Carmi was Achar, the troubler of Israel, who transgressed in the accursed thing. First Chronicles chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. As we conclude in the dividing reading of the Kings, we come into the new reading of First Chronicles. We're going to read First Chronicles chapter 1 to 5 today. It's very interesting. Trouble seemed to follow the family of Jacob. Have you ever noticed that? On the night Jacob wrestled with God before he reconciled with his brother Esau, the Lord actually renamed him Israel because he had strived with man and with God and had prevailed. That's a name from God. And there is only one nation in the world today that bears that name. Israel is a nation God designated for this time in history. The Lord will come soon and we should be ready. But in the history of Israel, we see the genealogies of the tribes. First Chronicles chapter two, or chapter two through 10, all of these men ended up being tribes with the exception of Joseph, whose sons were the tribes of Manasseh and the tribes of Ephraim. There was consistent internal trouble in the tribes, and the Bible does not shy away from that trouble. The Bible is not a book of propaganda, but it is a book that is committed to the truth. Believe me, it's true. <laughs> and as we begin to look at it, we begin to understand that God has revealed something really, really fascinating that's true in all of us. All of us have trouble inside of us because according to the book of Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, that's really important. Remember that the wages of sin are death, 623 Romans, but the gift of God is eternal life. So God has given us eternal life as a result of that through Jesus Christ. So get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. We're dealing with 1 Chronicles chapter 1 through 5. And if you don't have a Bible guide, you can write for yours. We'll send it to you, call, and you can also get it that way, or you can get it by going to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, click on the Bible Guide page, and it'll take you to a place where you can donate, make a donation in any amount. Thank you so much for your donations. They really are meaningful to us, and they help us 
That's how we stay alive here. We don't have, you know, grants from people or any of that. We have gifts. That's all we operate on is the gifts of people. So thank you so much for that. And uh, when you do that, uh, you can get with the Bible guide online seconds. You're within seconds of finding us. It takes you to the PDF files where you can download them and also uh, follow along with them. So that's it. Father, I pray today as we look at the trouble within, we are not only looking at the trouble within Israel, we're looking at the trouble within ourselves. And there's a lot of it, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name you would help us. Nobody's perfect. Clearly, nobody's perfect. And if we think we're perfect, help us to realize we're not. You're perfect, God. Now that's different. You are God. You're not man. So help us, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen and amen. Now these names are very challenging. I'll do my best, but I could be wrong. Uh, you know, not fluent in Hebrew. It becomes really exciting to, to see these names, but uh, let's take a look at them. Here we go. First Chronicles chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Now, these were the sons of Israel. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Fascinating. Now this brings me to the first point, which is Jacob, who was later renamed Israel by God himself, had 12 sons from the four women that uh, were with him. God knows the future and adjusts our present without removing free choice. And a lot of people say, well, how could God know the future if uh, we have free choice? Well, it's simple. God knows the future, knows how we'll choose, and he modifies his will around how we choose. So we still have free choice, but God still knows the future. And God also determines the future. And I want to tell you, God is so much higher than our minds. God is so much greater than what we think that it's hard for us to figure that out. That's why many uh, scientists today don't believe in God because the truth is that he is so far advanced from us and yet he comes down to the simplest person. That's God, that's our God, that's Jesus Christ. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Very interesting. Now let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 3. The sons of Judah. The sons of Judah were Ur. Onan and Shelah. These three were born to him by the daughter of Shua, the Canaanitess. Ur, the firstborn of Judah, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so he killed him. What? Absolutely. God is not human. God will punish those who are purely evil. This tells us a lot about what happens and what takes place in that Canaanite culture. There is always forgiveness from God when we truly repent. When we truly repent, we need to remember that truly repenting means turning away from our sin, coming to God and taking a new attitude of sin. A new attitude is sin is bad. We are going to avoid sin. You know, it's like what I say to people, we sit down with each other. We sit down with ourselves and we're looking at ourselves at the table and we say, we're no longer going to sin. And the other self says, what do you mean we're no longer going to sin? And the self says, I'm not going to sin anymore. And the other self says, yes, we are. And there's that fight that goes on. That's part of the sanctification process. Beloved, we have to choose not to sin. Sin is so tempting, but God helps us. The Holy Spirit helps us in that choice. Now let's go on in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 4. It says, and Tamar, his daughter-in-law, bore him Perez and Zerah. All the sons of Judah were five. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamuel. The sons of Zerah were Zimri and Ethan, Heman, Calco, and Dera, five of them in all. The son of Carmi was Achar, the troubler of Israel, who transgressed the accursed thing. Isn't that something? This troubler of Israel was interesting. Achar, also known as Achan, took from Jericho. 
and was known as the troubler of Israel. God always tells the truth about history. Let me tell you something. God always tells the truth about history. When we understand that the word of God is not propaganda or some way to promote us, and we realize that God tells the truth about his people, then we understand that it tells the truth about us. Then we realize this is, this is from God because God also tells us that he loves us in this book. Jesus Christ loves us and gave his life for us. For the gift of God is eternal life to all of those who believe in his name, who call out to him and say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I desire you to come and live in my life. That's very important for us to remember. So today, let's remember, Father God, we thank you. And, and Jesus, come into my heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, because we are beginning reading through First and Second Chronicles, I want to take a minute and look at these books as you know their own thing, their own segment here. So we're going to be going into the history and the content and the authorship of the books of Chronicles. Take a look. The Old Testament books of First and Second Chronicles cover the widest swath of history of any book of the Bible. The opening genealogy begins with the first human man, and the final event is the decree of Cyrus the Great in 538 BC. The main focus of the books is the time period of the kings of Israel and Judah, which is at first surprising given the other three books of the Bible already dedicated to this. In fact, about 50% of the information in Chronicles is already found in 2 Samuel and Kings. The other 50% of new information, paired with the editing choices of Chronicles author, allow us to see the book's theological insight, the purpose for which it was written. The authorship of the books are tied into its date of composition. The date of writing must be after the time of the exile, as the end of the exile is recorded. The end of 2 Chronicles is also repeated in the opening of the Book of Ezra. This flows nicely with a Jewish tradition of the Talmud that claims Ezra as chronicler. Certainly, Ezra is a possibility, and the issue of authorship has been debated extensively using book themes, grammar, and word use, among others. But as the books themselves don't claim an author, it's still speculative. Nevertheless, Chronicles is often dated to the 5th century BC. The name of Chronicles ultimately comes from the Hebrew title for the books that literally means the affairs of the days, or annals, or chronicles. This Hebrew phrase is used 33 times in Kings in reference to the sources being used to write Kings, and it's used once in 1 Chronicles, referring to the official court record of David's reign. Looking at what content the author of Chronicles repeated from the other biblical books, what content he added, and the language he chose to use, reveals for us some of the themes and perhaps the overall biblical purpose of the book. A clear theme is the unity of God's people, of all Israel, a phrase used 40 times in Chronicles while only 18 times in Kings. The Davidic covenant is also a clear focus as most of the books are about David and Solomon directly. The Jerusalem temple and the worship practices surrounding it are another clear focus. God's justice in rewarding obedience and punishing disobedience in his covenant people, the importance of having an upright willing heart over bland obedience, and an effort to record previously left out prayers of some major kings rounds out some of the more personal themes. Overall, it's easy to see that chronicles were written to a new generation of Israelites taking back the promised land. These exiles had returned. What did God have for them now? What exactly did their history mean? Chronicles seems to have been written to answer these questions and bring all of Israel's history back into a guiding role for a new generation of covenant people. 
So in the books of First and Second Chronicles, we have a few really good opportunities. I mean, the first obvious opportunity is to really read through again and get really familiar with the history uh, of the kings. Uh, but another opportunity that we have is to pay attention to the differences between Chronicles and Kings, because we've just gone through Kings, of course, uh, because there's these differences are going to reveal uh, the purpose behind the writing of First and Second Chronicles. So different aspects that the Chronicles emphasize uh, versus what the kings have emphasized is going to reveal to us what the author is trying to highlight, what theological point, you know, point about the nature of God and the nature of this history of Israel and Judah. Uh, it, so paying attention to those differences becomes key. So as you're reading through, uh, it's always a good idea when you hit a certain king to flip back to first and second kings and find the record of that king of Judah uh, in the record of kings and just do a side-by-side -side comparison because uh, for me, not only then will you know the history of that king really well, but you'll see the different areas that the chronicler is trying to highlight for their reader. You know, one of the interesting things is who wrote the chronicles mm -hmm. and who wrote the Kings. Some mm -hmm. people say, well, Jeremiah must have written the Kings and uh, Ezra must have been a part of the Chronicles. We don't know. It absolutely had to have been a compilation of I totally records agree. already because it's a it's a historical record of Kings, right? So yeah. they would have gone back into the records. Totally agree. And but. and you, you look at it and you begin to understand it. And then the question is, why is there such a long genealogy mm -hmm. between First Chronicles and uh, 1 and First Chronicles mm -hmm. 12? You know, what's the deal there? But uh, it gets really interesting when you look at the Chronicles and what it emphasizes, which te tends to be more from a priestly point of view mm -hmm. than what the Kings emphasizes, which is more from a King's point of view. Very interesting. <laughs> I can, we could discuss this all day. Anyway, okay. Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, well, as you guys already mentioned today, we are reading First Chronicles chapters 1 to 5. And with that, I actually want to talk about Noah's flood. Now, it might seem strange to talk about the global flood while we're reading Chronicles, but you know what? The chronicler clearly thought it was important to establish the past, and so should we. Now, of course, there is a lot of skepticism today surrounding the flood, both by non-believers and, sadly, even by believers as well. And the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 4 said as much would happen in the last days. Of course, just because people deny that the flood happened doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Actually, there are so many flood stories found all over the world which speak of this very event that it should be absolutely undeniable. Now, one of the most famous of these flood stories is the Epic of Gilgamesh. But of course, with skepticism being at the level it is in our modern world, it has actually been suggested that the Bible is just a retelling of the Gilgamesh epic, which is itself based on a local flood event. But the big question is, which came first, the Bible or the Epic of Gilgamesh? Let's study. Though once largely accepted as factual history, the Genesis Flood is now one of the most attacked and ridiculed portions of the entire Bible. Perhaps this was partially due to the discovery of the now famous Epic of Gilgamesh. These 12 tablets were found in 1853 by archaeologist Austin Henry Layard in the palace library of the ancient Assyrian capital Nineveh, and were dated from about 650 BC, although the poem was much older. Since this discovery, critics claim that the biblical flood is just a borrowing of this epic, which in turn was an embellishment of a local flood. However, when the two accounts are compared, the Bible by far contains the most realistic portrayal, suggesting it is the original rather than a retelling. While multiple examples could be given, probably the most significant is the shape of the Ark in both accounts. For instance, Korean naval architects have confirmed that a barge with the biblical Ark's dimensions would have optimal stability. On the other hand, the cube-shaped craft of the Gilgamesh epic would be utterly disastrous. Actually, even the order in the releasing of the birds makes more sense in the Genesis account. For example, in reverse to the Gilgamesh epic, Noah first releases a raven, followed sequentially by doves. Releasing the raven first makes a lot of sense because as a scavenger, it was more than capable of dwelling on the tops of the recently exposed mountains. Its non-return indicated to Noah that some of the land had been exposed. He then later sent out the doves, which prefer valleys to mountains, and likes dry and clean places for nesting. Hence, the doves' non-return signaled that the earth was sufficiently dry. 
Based upon realism, it is more likely that the Biblical Flood is the original account and that it is the Gilgamesh epic which is the retelling. But is there any additional evidence that the global flood of the Bible is the original account? Assuming for a moment that the Bible is correct about its history and a global flood did occur with a worldwide dispersion of the people from Babel shortly thereafter, then we would expect to find people groups with a common tradition based on the real event in scripture. In fact, this is exactly what we find, with thousands of flood stories all over the world, from Peru to China to Russia, Hawaii and beyond. Significantly, these legends share common elements with the Bible, some very much so. Not only do these similarities point to a common source, but the very existence of these numerous flood legends themselves point to a real-world event. Indeed, it is common to make legends out of historical events, but not history from legends. And one of the reasons why the details in legends differ somewhat from the scriptural account is simply because generally traditions become more garbled as they move further in time and place from the real event. Thank God that the true account has been preserved in the Bible. Really, when you spend some time studying other flood stories, it really becomes clear that the Bible gives the most full and realistic account. And what you just saw was only just a little sampling of the evidence that the biblical account is the original. And the many retellings of the flood event found all over the world provide an incredible witness and corroboration that what the Bible says happened did happen. We mustn't allow ourselves to be led astray by the Bible critic. Here she is merely bluffing on this issue and doing exactly what the Apostle Peter said that they would in the last days as they continue to deny this very real biblical event. Right, I've, I've heard, I've read in, in several articles and I've heard that there's 135 cultures around the world that have a flood story. Oh yeah, and, and, and virtually incredible. all of them, yeah. There's just, there, I know Answers in Genesis just released a new book just of North and South America of all the legends from there, but they're found all around the world. And yet there are people looking for a big asteroid to hit the earth to kill the dinosaurs, you know, two million or three million years ago. And they're looking for a catastrophe event, but yeah. you see the flood. Yeah. And you see Mount St. Helena, what, what happened there and everything else. You see the flood. Yeah, the flood was also probably the trigger for the Ice Age. Um, evolutionists, exactly. Evolutionists are not sure what triggered that, and they think there was a lot of Ice Ages, but probably it was the flood that created the conditions necessary uh, for that one Ice Age. And so the weather oscillates back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Right, until the end and that's kind of where the Neanderthals kind of fit in there. Well, yeah. That's another story for another day. That is fascinating <laughs> stuff. Okay, Janice, go ahead. Well, we are in First Chronicles, and in Chapter 2 we see the Chronicler. Chronicler, that's not an easy mm -hmm. word to it say. It is not. <laughs> but we see him list in chronological order the sons, the 12 sons that were born to Jacob, who God renamed Israel. And then we see by each chapter, we're seeing the family of David and the family and the family and the family and the family, and they're listed and listed and listed and listed. And sometimes it, it, it does grow a little tedious reading through all of these different names. And, and this was the son of so-and-so, and then it goes on and on and on. But what it reminded me of today was that God thinks very much about families. God knows our names. God knows who we came from, where we came from, and where we're going. There's a really important book called the Book of Life. And when you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your name is written in that book. And because God sent his only son to bring restoration to us, Rod, then we become the adopted sons and daughters of God. That restoration is brought back where we can take that thing that separates us from God, which is, I'm talking about sin, that separates us from God, and we turn away from that, and we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, he does, and then we become sons and the daughters of Christ. Now, there's, I, I know there was a big hoopla a while back, a few years ago about, you know, uh, women didn't like to be called sons or that things referred to as sons or men or whatever. But let me just set straight here in the Bible 
that what that means, that we are all the sons of God, which means we all have inheritance, is actually a really wonderful term. It means that there's no difference, that the inheritance that I receive will be the same inheritance that you will receive, Rod. God doesn't see the difference between Rod's a man and Janice is a woman. We are one, we are God's children, and, it's, and we have inherited things because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I totally agree. I totally agree. So this, when we are reading the genealogies, just remember as we get tired of going through these names and trying to figure out what they, how to say them and how to pronounce them, that each and every individual is special to God. He knows where you are. He knows where you've come from and where you're going. And I think it's important to remember that we are together in ministry mm -hmm. and you have so many talents and abilities I do not have. <laughs> and do, vice versa. You really do. And, uh, you know, and our God, children. And our as children well. as well. And God sees us all, you know. And Brandon is behind the control. He's in the control room. And uh, Chris is over there, over there, wherever he's at. There he is. <laughs> and DJ's over there. And everybody has talents and skills, and God has called everybody. And if we would just respond to him mm -hmm. and say, yes, Jesus, I love you today. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and be my Lord. I believe you died on the cross and you rose miraculously. Come now, be my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we pray and we say, Lord, I want to thank you that your word is not some ancient book, but a much needed help and truth in today's very troubled world. And Father, we pray today for those who are persecuted under your name, that you would help them and give them strength and help the persecutors to know you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name, we pray for the persecuted church to know you. And we said together, amen.